as well. You should be able to get it through the YouTube once you get to this one. But today, let's start. Uh, we have a lot to cover today, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So today we're going to be focusing on chapter eight and part of chapter five and talk about control of gene expression. So we're going to start off by uh, reviewing the stuff that we've talked about up till now, the last couple of weeks with how genes are expressed and what is the purpose of expression of genes inside our cells. Um, and we will then look at specifically how transcription is regulated uh, inside a cell, both at a cellular level and then also at an organismal level. And then we are going to look at how that regulation uh, leads to specialization of cells of various types of different cells that we need as a multicellular organism to survive. And finally, we're gonna wrap up with talking about some post-transcriptional controls. So after transcription is finished, what do we do uh, to control when a product is made, a uh, functional product is in the form of protein or mRNA is made and when it is not. And some of this we've already touched on in this last lecture when we talked about mRNA processing and control. But we'll talk more about that in a little bit more detail and talk about some alternate ways that they can be controlled as well, okay? So um, we as multicellular organism, um, it's, it, this whole process of cell differentiation and transcriptional regulation is especially important in any multicellular organisms um, like us. Because for us, it is essential to create these specialized cells that are needed to do specific work and to make our bodies run efficiently uh, with minimum energy requirements, so to speak. Um, however, as we've talked about before, if we were to look at our DNA sequences um, and just the entire you know, genome that is resting inside our nucleus, every single one of our cells, regardless of where they are coming from, will have the same entire DNA. So just looking at those sequences is not going to be enough to get us insight into what it is that makes an hepatocyte a hepatocyte versus an astrocyte and astrocyte. Um, it is obviously something different. So to look at that, we have to look at functional products in the form of proteins or the intermediaries in the form of mRNAs or messenger RNAs. That's what we are gonna be focusing on. So looking at differentiation then becomes important uh, to look at, well, what is it? How is it that we can control this process? and make these cells differentiate in a particular way that we want them to differentiate into. Um, so here, we are looking at differentiated cells that are already fully differentiated. And we're trying to see, well, what can we do with these cells? How far can they go in the development process if that's all the cell that we've got and we don't have a totipotent cell like we did back in the day? So uh, that's how cloning was first examined as well. All these experiments are example of how you got to that first dolly the sheep uh, in the form of a cloned sheep, right? So in this case, um, in the first one, we have an adult frog where we've taken some skin cells from this frog and cultured them in a Petri dish. Now, if you just keep them in culture like that, they're never gonna change into a tadpole or a frog ever again. However, if we were to take the nucleus of the cell, just the nucleus, not any of the cytoplasm, and add it to an unfertilized frog egg where its own nucleus has been destroyed, then that would lead to a normal embryo and a normal tadpole. That lets you know that that nucleus contained all the information that you needed for the tadpole to form However, something's happened from that initial fertilized egg to the point that it became a skin cell that rendered that other extra information useless, right? Essentially, somehow now that information couldn't be used in the form of normal skin cells to create more tadpoles. But if you kind of dial it back and put it into an environment that does not have all those signals that were now in the skin cells, fully differentiated form uh, present, 
then you can access that information and recruit these cells back into that embryonic state where they can now create a tadpole again. The same thing happens when we look at a plant and look at something like a carrot or a cabbage or another um, vegetable that you could just take a small section of and you can create a proliferating cell mass from there. You could keep that in some kind of a nutrient rich media to keep growing these cells. However, you can also modify these cells and reactivate their embryonic state so that they can provide you with a fully developed normal carrot plant or another vegetable plant. So that again, lets you know that just because that cell is fully differentiated doesn't mean that it's lost that part of the genome. That genome is still there. It just needs to be accessed in a different way. It needs the right cues and environment to be active in. So when we did the first uh, you know, cloning in actual organism state, we did cloning and we do cloning all the time where we're just taking a single gene and putting it inside a different cell or a different organism and making it work. But the first time that we were actually able to clone an entire organism, right, in the form of Dolly, what they had done at that time was taken cells from an adult, somatic cells from an adult sheep. And they had taken those cells and they had taken the nucleus from that cell and put it into a unfertilized egg where that nucleus had been destroyed by whatever way, right? They could take it out or they could, uh, you know, and make it into an enucleated egg and then inject their own somatic nucleus inside. Um, but in either case, that reconstructed zygote could then give rise to a fully functional embryo that then gave rise to a fully functional cloned animal. In this case, they're showing it from cows that where it's placed inside a foster mom and then you get a calf or in the sheep, again, the same way. The difference here, however, as we found later on, is that somatic cells imprint in a way is still there. So whatever environmental factors that had been, that, that cell had been exposed to before it became part of this reconstructed zygote can still have an effect on the progeny that gets out of that. Um, so Dolly, for example, died at a very young age for sheep um, because of what they called old age, because the cell that she was derived from was already five years old at that time. And so the telomeres were kind of frozen at the state that they were in. They're not gonna be uh, expanded beyond that point. So she died at a very young age too, um, which would have been the final lifetime for that somatic cell. Questions about this? I don't actually see the chat. I wanna get the chat out. So if they had used a younger cell, would she have lived a normal lifespan, do you think? Yes, she should have lived a longer lifespan if it was a younger cell. That's pretty cool. Yep. Yeah, chat refuses to come up for some reason. I'll just keep going back and looking at it. And uh, when they injected the nucleus, how it fertilized itself? Since well, remember, the nucleus didn't have to fertilize itself because it was a somatic cell. So it had the whole entire genome. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yes. So it was already deployed, right? It wasn't an actual egg. But like uh, like kind of proteins in the egg lead it to differentiate and become a zygote? Yeah. So it was essentially as if that cell had just been, and that egg had just been fertilized when that nucleus was added because it was already at a deployed state. And then the same type of behavior would have started in that egg and it would have continued on its normal course. Yes. Oh, wow. So now there are still some, you know, like I'm simplifying it, but yes, that's essentially what it works with. And we will talk about that a little bit in another chapter. I'll show you some cool video on what happens at the moment of fertilization in the egg and how cell signaling controls that no other sperm gets in or, you know, that the process of actual now cell division starts and the development of zygote starts. Okay.
Okay, so different cell types that we produce obviously um, have different sets of proteins in it. That's what's defining that cell as a muscle cell or a liver cell or a retinal cell, right? Um, however, there's still going to be certain proteins that are going to be common to all cells, regardless of where they are and what final function they perform. These proteins are what we call housekeeping proteins or housekeeping, you know, the genes related to them are called housekeeping genes. So these are just, you know, like the metabolic processes, the way our cells are normally functioning, the way a proteasome is going to work or the way ribosomal proteins are going to be made. All cells are going to need those things. All cells are going to be using them all the time and they will all be made all the time. However, in addition to those housekeeping genes and protein, or proteins, their each cell type will have its own little specialized group of proteins that are distinctive to that cell alone. And they allow the cell to perform the functions that they are needed to perform. Um, now these can be controlled both by internal signals, but they're also in, uh, controlled by the external signals, environmental cues as well. That's why a hepatocyte or a liver cell may respond very differently to a, the same environmental signal uh, compared to a retinal cell or an astrocyte from the brain. Each cell type, because of its background, will respond differently to the same environmental stimulus in order to kind of adapt to it and respond to it in its own way, according to its own needs. Now, we've already talked about many layers of gene expression or just you know, expression of this final product. Um, however, there are many more that we still need to kind of touch base on. So when we look at the central dogma where you have your DNA and you created RNA transcript in the form of the pre-mRNA, then you have your messenger RNA. That all happens inside the nucleus. Already over here, there are gonna be several layers of control that of, for regulation of this gene expression. One is going to be at the level of just the DNA itself, the way it is folded, the way it is modified, the way it is, whether, whether it is heterochromatin where it's tightly packed or euchromatin where it's more open. So the gene expression can actually happen. And, you know, that's one part of regulation. Another part of regulation is what we call transcriptional control in the form of actual regulator sequences within the genome itself, right? And those genome sequences are going to recruit either, uh, you know, proteins or other binding partners that will either enhance the function of genes or repress the function of genes that they are controlling. Then you have your RNA transcript that comes off and that RNA transcript can then be processed, can then be regulated further through RNA processing control. We talked about how in prokaryotes, you can have multiple genes all in a row controlled by the same promoter. Uh, we also talked about how the same gene uh, product, the same RNA, can be spliced differently in different cell types in eukaryotes to give you very different isoforms of the same protein. So those are part of the RNA processing control. We also talked about other ways that RNA, the messenger RNA can be controlled, whether it is to increase the stability of it by adding that poly A tail or adding specific three prime and five prime untranslated regions, um, the addition of the cap, all those things, they're going to control how the RNA is going to, um, you know, work after it has been processed. Then you have another control at the point when you are taking these RNA molecules, these messenger, final messenger RNAs from the nucleus into the cytosol to be translated. Uh, so there is going to be, again, a transport and localization control at this level as well. Now, once outside the uh, nucleus, it can either be translated um, or it can be degraded, depending on whether it was needed or not. If it's not needed, it will be degraded. If it is needed, then it will be translated. However, there are several factors that's going to control how much is going to be, what's the rate of translation for that messenger RNA. 
if you need a lot of it, it will be trans translated faster than if you didn't really need too much of it. And we'll talk about some of those today. Then finally, once you have the actual protein product, it again doesn't mean that it's going to be functional right away. In some cases, the activity is controlled by other modifications happening on top of that protein molecule in order to control its activity and in, in order to control its localization, whether it's in the right place or not, whether it's gonna work or not, uh, is going to be dependent on these control mechanisms. And these control mechanisms change depending on environmental cues, as well as internal signals. Now, a protein may remain inactive for its entire lifetime, or it may be inactive at times and then activated and then become inactive again. Other times, a protein may not be needed at that time and will be degraded, and that would be another control as well. So the first thing that we're going to look at is transcriptional. We're just going to kind of go through these several different processes, and we're going to look at how each one of them is controlled at a more general level inside the body. So the first one that we're going to be talking about is transcriptional regulation. Now, this is where that last part of chapter five is going to come in. So we're going to look at regulatory sequences within the genome, within the actual you know, nucleotide sequences that proteins can bind to, that regulators can bind to in order to either activate or repress gene expression. We are also going to remind ourselves of how chromosome structure is regulated and controlled through various part of cell cycle or through gene expression in general. And then we're going to finally talk about post-transcriptional processing and control of that mRNA in order for it to be activated, okay? So let's talk about first transcriptional regulators. There are several type of transcriptional regulators that are present inside our body. Their main job is to bind to specific DNA binding motifs. A motif is similar to the, a domain um, as we've talked about before, it's just a small sequence. It's conserved, relatively conserved sequence of DNA. It's going to be a specific set of G's and C's and A's and T's that are going to be consistent um, that these particular regulators can, um, you know, recognize and bind to based on their binding pocket. And that is going to be what's going to help them make their function. Now there are four different class of these proteins. Um, they that through which you know that basically are based on the structure of these molecules that allow them to interact with DNA. One of that is that a lot of these regulators will contain what we call alpha helices that can interact with the double helix structure of the DNA itself and kind of hug it and bind to it in a way that it can interact with it directly. In addition, the, another one that we can see a lot of times is what we call zinc fingers. In zinc finger regulators, they have a central portion that recognizes a particular binding area on the genome, and then two uh, kind of arms that come off of it in that 3D structure of the protein that contain beta sheets that can wrap around that particular sequence to interact with that in its own way. Another one is what we call a leucine zipper, where there are two, usually two protein molecules that combine together to form a dimer and um, can interact with the DNA and move along it kind of like a zipper uh, motif. And then finally, you have homeodomains. These are domains within the protein, small, again, um, sequences, a small uh, chain of amino acid sequences that can have non-covalent interactions with either the backbone or the nucleotide base pairs within the, uh, the DNA. So in this case, you have these serine, arginine, and asparagine that can form hydrogen bonds with the base pairs as well as the backbone and cause that structure to change its orientation in response to 
Now, these transcription regulators, many of them are going to be binding to the DNA as a, as a dimer instead of just by themselves. So here is an example where you can have a regulatory sequence on the DNA and a transcriptional regulator comes and binds to it just by itself. Many times a single regulator is not gonna be enough to have its final function. And the only way that it will have a more potent function, it may still have a, you know, an effect, but it won't be as um, elevated as it could be together. Um, and the dimer requires that there are two repeated regulatory sequences right next to each other inside that same domain right on the DNA that allows for the dimer to come to it and uh, interact with that regulatory sequence. Here's an example of one of these regulatory sequences. This is given for a, a protein that is essential for differentiation processes in many of our cell types. It's called NANOG. Um, and this particular protein, it recognizes um, this sequence, which again, now the difference between the motif and domain is a little bit, you know, flexibility in these motifs. Many of those will be the same. So these two A's are going to be conserved. However, this first letter could be a T or a C. If it is a T, it is more likely to be active. If it's a C, it is less likely to be active. But the conserved sequence as such, you know, requires that there are these two A's followed by either two G's or two T's, and then some mix of A's and Z's. Um, but that sequence is what Nanog will bind to, uh, will recognize and bind to, to regulate proteins uh, expression that are downstream of that, gene expression of proteins downstream of that. Now, how transcription is regulated is through these you know, regulators either acting as repressors where they can turn off the gene or, uh, or activators where they can turn on the genes. In addition to these, you can also have inducers and co-repressors. These are not proteins, but rather small molecules like cofactor A or like, you know, dexamethasone, for example, in the case of um, the muscle differentiation, anything that can bind to your actual uh, protein to activate it in order for it to then get translocated to the nucleus to bind to the DNA sequence that it needs to regulate. So these inducers and co-repressors are just small mo molecules that will participate in the regulation by altering the functions of these repressor and activator proteins. So many times the repressor and activator proteins don't work by themselves, but require these inducers and core repressors to first either activate them or inactivate them in order to do their work. So any questions on this before we go to an actual example? No? It's really frustrating that I can't see this chat. I don't know how to make it appear. Oh, I don't want to pull, but I can add a pull. Yay, you're back. Thank you for coming. Okay. <clears throat> so now remember that a protein is going to be activated by these co-inducers and by these, you know, small molecules. In addition, a protein can also be activated or repressed based on its binding partner in the form of another protein. So there are many activators and repressors inside or regulatory proteins inside our uh, cells that can bind to multiple proteins inside the cell, depending on what signal they receive from the uh, plasma membrane uh, through the environmental cues. Sometimes when they bind to one protein, they will activate, for example, proliferation However, when they're binding to a different binding partner, they may do exact opposite, or they may have a completely different function. Like in this case, they may increase differentiation when they are binding to one particular protein, while in the form of another protein, they are going to activate proliferation. 
So here, the example that you are seeing is from a max protein that can interact both with MYC as well as with MXT. Now, MYC is a known mitogenic signal. So anytime MYC is binding to another protein, usually it activates proliferation. So in this case as well, it's binding to, it's binding sequence through its interaction with MYC. So it works as a dimer where MAX and MYC together will recognize this E box with this specific sequence. And that specific sequence will lead to expression of genes downstream that are going to activate proliferation. However, if instead the outside cues get the max protein to interact with MXT instead, they are not going to be having the same effect. The interaction of these two together will actually inhibit those same functional proteins or uh, those same genes that were going to induce proliferation. And instead, it's going to change an entirely different set of genes that are going to induce uh, differentiation instead. Okay, so here you see those bindings happening uh, when Max and Mick are bound together again as a dimer, it kind of looks like a leucine zipper, right? They have these alpha helix structures that are interacting with it, with the DNA like a leucine zipper. Um, and in this case, they are going to activate gene expression versus if Max and MXD are bound together. Again, while the structure is very similar, the function is very different at the end of the day. Now in prokaryotes, um, they often, they are more efficient than our multicellular organisms because of their simple one cell state. They need to be, they don't have the luxury of dividing and ruling different parts of the body or different functions by different cell types. So they try to, their genome is as efficient as possible. So in their genomes, many times you have what we call operons, which are cluster of genes that are all to transcribed together as a single unit. So the final mRNA does not contain just one, but multiple genes um, in a row that usually are all part of the same metabolic pathway. So this allows uh, the prokaryotes to have a single regulator control the expression of that entire cluster as a single transcriptional switch rather than having individual regulators for each one. Now, an example of that is the trip operator, um, the trip operon, which is to make tryptophan. Now, if you remember from last uh, lecture, we talked about how tryptophan is this um, amino acid, there's only one codon that codes for tryptophan. And it is somewhat of a special amino acid in that, right? And it is precious. It's something that we can consume, but because it is precious and because it is required in multiple proteins, our bodies can also synthesize their own tryptophan. These bacterial genes, the prokaryotes can also make it themselves. However, to make their own tryptophan requires a whole set of genes to be expressed. Uh, it's several step process. So there's a series of enzymes that are required to make tryptophan when it is low inside the cell and it cannot be taken, ingested by these cells. Organized in a single operon, in the trip operon, all in a row, in these E. coli so they can make a single mRNA molecule controlled by the same promoter, which is the tryptophan operator in this case, right? So the promoter region, remember, will have the negative 10 sequence with a Tata box-like domain and the negative 35 sequence. And then somewhere in there, there is that trip operator, the tryptophan operator that will control when this is going to start to be activated versus when it will be shut down. Now, when we look at this sequence a little bit closer, this is again showing you those two sequences. It shows the two promoter sequences at negative 10 and negative 35. And then you have the operator region, which will bind to the tryptophan um, regulatory protein. And then you have at the plus one, the start of transcription. When the tryptophan is high inside the cell, when you have plenty of it around, you can have lots of codons, 
anti, you know, uh, tRNAs carrying tryptophan, and you have some free tryptophan running around. That trip, uh, free tryptophan will bind to the trip repressor protein. That's the regulatory protein for the trip operon, causing it to become activated and bind to the operator region on the trip operon, right? So in between the negative and negative 35 sequences, that operator sequence. When that is bound to the, uh, the, the trip repressor is bound to that operator region, the RNA polymerase can't bind there and it can't go through. It's kind of like a block. So operon will be off, no transcription will happen. However, when tryptophan is low and the cell does not have enough for its needs, the trip repressor won't have any freely available tryptophan to bind to it. So it's just going to be in its normal inactive state and the operon, uh, the operator will be open, right? It, there'll be nothing bound to it. RNA polymerase can bind to it and the mRNA transcription can occur. So that's the simple you know, uh, way in which it works. The operon is on when trip is low, the repressor can or the regulatory protein doesn't have its little core repressor to go along with it. So it doesn't bind and it doesn't cause the block. Now, looking at it a little bit more in detail, however, there is more to it, right? So this is looking at how the actual mRNA at the end of the day is also controlling this whole process. So when um, you look at that long operon um, that is transcribed, the resulting mRNA that you get is this really long mRNA because it has several different genes on it. It can form several uh, types of secondary structures, right? This actually is true not just for that, but any other protein that may have tryptophan in there too. So any mRNA that you have inside the cells that requires tryptophan will also be forming these kind of secondary structures, but we are focusing just on the trip operon right now. The trip operon mRNA starts off by requiring two tryptophan in its beginning stages, uh, two tryptophan molecules uh, in a row, two tryptophan amino acids in a row. So when tryptophan is present, lots of tryptophan floating around, the ribosome is going to just fizz through it, keep going, and keep attaching the amino acids and making the polypeptide chain, translating the mRNA. And no uh, problem will occur until it reaches that final, you know, section where this 3-4 binding is occurring, that will slow it down because that will be towards this polyutyl where it will then signal the termination of transcription and the ribosome will fall off. However, when tryptophan is not present, when it is low, the ribosome will get to the trip codon and no tRNA will come carrying a tryptophan. So it will stall. Sometimes it will stall quicker than others, but it will basically stall. That stall causes the rest of that structure to form this alternate 3D structure, right? Because it is stalled here, this alternate 3D structure can form due to base pairing in region two and three. And that stalls the transcription. And that's another way the cell gets signaled that, hey, I'm out of tryptophan, I need to make more. So that's another way that regulation can be taking place. And this is looking at the mRNA that you have that requires tryptophan, okay? Questions on this one up till here. I believe there's a question in the chat. The question in the chat, which is not, again, showing it kept disappearing. None of these actually contain the tryptophan residue. They do. That actually answers the, your question uh, right there. So here, um, they do, uh, for these ones, the tryptophan, this operon does contain areas that require up here. These, some of these do require tryptophan. So that's an additional control that you have. Not all of them will, but some of them will require tryptophan. Does 
Oh, yes, that's. Yes, so they will not require the tryptophan enzyme as much or amino acid as much as normal proteins. It's the tryptophan, again, is one of those precious amino acids that's not going to be present in every single protein. It is only present in certain proteins. Um, and it is, like I said, it has this unique ability that, you know, it, a unique thing about it that only one codon codes for it. But right here, when you looked at this, this was what I was talking about, that even in that trip operon, right? So that is those exact ones, this one, this long sequence. In this E region, there are a couple of tryptophans required. And this is to further, it's a feedback loop in a way, to further enhance the production of tryptophan it's to make sure that you'll get enough tryptophan there. So it's an internal regulator. So one regulation is right here where the tryptophan, the freely available tryptophan is required to bind to the regulator proteins to repress that operon. But even once that operon is present, you wanna make sure it's active. You wanna make sure you keep it activated long enough. So it's gonna keep it activated until this translation portion is not getting stalled. So there are tryptophans within that sequence as well. Does that answer your question, Ryan? I have lost the chat completely. Come on, chat. I have a quick question. Yes. So when you have low tryptophan, it mm -hmm. blocks the mRNA, is that correct? When you have low tryptophan, it's going to be stalled right here, right? Because it, the ribosome is not going to be able to get a charged tRNA with tryptophan on it to put in there. So it's going to stall it. So even being able to make the tryptophan, that process is going to be stalled a little bit, right? Okay. Until you get enough tryptophan in the system for it to run smoothly, which then will create a negative feedback loop so that it terminates transcription and doesn't make it anymore. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the activator, you know, in this case, you are um, using it to repress the gene expression, right? Uh, the actual regulator proteins. Now you can also have proteins that act as activators, obviously, to regulate operon's gene expression. Uh, and in this case, many times those regulatory proteins require, again, a cofactor of some sort, a binding activator to activate it. Uh, so we're going to look at an example of one of those now. And that, again, is looking at a prokaryotic system in the form of LAC operon. Now, the LAC operon is actually interesting in that it requires both a repressor as well as an activator to control it in just the right way. So if you like a look at the LAC Z gene, uh, the LAC operon, again, contains multiple genes in a row uh, that are going to make uh, lactose, uh, but in this case, uh, not lactose, but that are going to metabolize it, you have an operator sequence at the start of transcription. So this is a little bit different that before you saw the repressor was between in the promoter region between negative 10 and negative 35. In this case, you have an operator region that is after that negative 10. So right around that transcription site, start of transcription. And then you have another regulator region, which is before that negative uh, you know, 35 site, and that's at the cap binding site. So you have two regulatory regions that are flanking the promoter region. And one of them is gonna be repressor and the other one is going to be an activator region. When you have plenty of glucose and plenty of lactose available in the media, those this operon is going to be switched off. Okay. Now, E. coli in general, like most bacteria, prefer glucose as their sugar source, and that's the one that they like to use to metabolize. However, they will be able to survive on other sugar sources as well. So in this case, we've given them plenty of glucose, plenty of alternate source in the form of lactose, and the operon will be switched off. There'll be no need for it. When there's plenty of glucose, but there is no lactose in the system, the lac repressor 
would bind as a dimer to that first operator. However, that is still going to keep that system shut off. So now, again, there is no transcription happening. When there's no glucose in the system, what happens is that now the cell is, doesn't have enough glucose to metabolize. And what you will have is a overflow of cyclic AMP, which was what it got after metabolizing its glucose. That cyclic AMP binds to the cap activator that then allows it to dimerize and bind to this activator region. However, if there is no lactose, the lactopressor would still be there because this operon requires lactose to function. And if there is no glucose, the activator would still be there, would come and bind to it, but it won't be enough to activate the operon. It will still be off. In order for the operon to be actually on and activated so that it can metabolize that lactose in place of glucose, you have to have deficiency in glucose and lots of lactose available. Only then will the lac repressor fall off and the glucose, act, you know, because there was no glucose and cyclic AMP was high, the cap activator would still be there recruiting the um, RNA polymerase so that it can bind to the promoter region and activate this signal. So in this case, the lac apron is requiring multiple regulatory proteins so that it preferentially allows the E. coli to utilize all the glucose first before it switches to an alternate sugar source. Okay? Yes, no. Yeah. Okay. So we actually use this system in genetics and molecular biology to our advantage by we've created an alternate form of this where we have a plasmid that contains the lac promoter that's regulated the same way. But in this case, we control it through IPTG molecule, which works similarly in activation as what we just saw. And so in this case, uh, you know, you can normally find it uh, inside the cells, the bacterial cells uh, linked to the T7 gene, which will then control the LAC gene and control this whole process. We replace the, LAC, the T7 gene with whatever target gene we want to put in. And that way we can control when this protein is going to be expressed by adding or removing IPTG to induce or repress that function. Okay. So that's an actual application in molecular biology or in research for this type of system, a control system. We also have similar systems available for tetra regulation, tetracycline regulation um, in eukaryotic systems where we can uh, either add or remove tetracycline to control the expression of a gene that we have input under the promoter um, regulation. Now, eukaryotic transcription regulators are a little bit different than they are not right there next to the promoter, but they can be far, far away. They usually are at a very different site from the promoter region. The same activator can interact with multiple uh, promoter regions to uh, either activate them or repress them. So again, these could be enhancers or repressors. In this case, we are showing you an enhancer binding site for a eukaryotic activator protein that would bind to the sequence and then control the transcription of the gene that it's supposed to control. Now, thinking about, well, it's thousands of base pairs away or at a distant site, how is it interacting? Is because of the way the promotin is set out inside the nucleus, how the DNA is controlled and looped and organized inside the nucleus. The way they are controlled is through that structural formation so that in those loops, those activator or enhancer regions are going to come in contact with that transcriptional uh, complex to mediate their activation or repression as needed. So here is an example how you would see it inside the cell. It's obviously a cartoon version of it. So you have your nucleosomes, they're all packing the DNA together, keeping it tightly packed. A transcriptional regulator when bound to one of these sequences 
will allow for chromatin remodeling complex and histone acetyl transfers to come through and acetylate the histones downstream from it um, and open up the chromatin and kind of unwind it from those nucleosomes so that now it is open and that Tata box is exposed for the transcriptional regulatory complex to come through and start the transcription of those uh, genes that are controlled by that promoter. So all it does is kind of it tags a region to be then remodeled and modified by the chromatin remodeling complex and histone acetyl transferases in order to open it up and make it um, amenable for initiation of transcription. Another way, you know, they can directly interact with mediator proteins as well and transcriptional regulators as well. And they do that in the way, again, that the DNA is looped inside the nucleus. So here you have a nucleus, uh, inside the nucleus, you have a, chromosome, a region of the chromosome that is shown with multiple loops all along its way. In these regions, you can see you have several genes within that that are controlled by same or similar enhancer sequences. While well, these loops are maintained inside the nucleus with the help of other proteins that are called clamp proteins. These clamp proteins basically hold onto those loops so that they are maintained in their structure and they are able to interact with their associated genes and have the effect that they need to have. So here you see two examples uh, where, you know, uh, next to each other, where it's the same enhancer activating a gene on either side of the loop, or it could be a different enhancer on a different loop affecting another gene. So here, um, many times, you don't just need one regulatory protein, but many regulatory sequences throughout the genome to activate a protein uh, gene expression to its full extent. Depending on how many of these are activated, you may slow down the transcription or increase the transcription rate of that same gene. In between each one of these enhancer uh, or repressor uh, sequences, these regulatory proteins, uh, wherever they're binding, you'll have the spacer DNA. The spacer DNA doesn't contain any regulatory sequences. Only these small regions, they are the ones that are containing the regulatory sequences that bind to these regulation proteins, regulatory proteins, either as just a monomer or a dimer or even in a combination. These regulatory proteins then interact with mediator proteins. Uh, they could be single or multiple one of these that then interact with the transcriptional complex and affect how it is going to be uh, working, whether it will activate it or repress it. So, you should know that there are multiple transcriptional regulators. You should know that in the in-between spacer DNA sequence doesn't contain any regulatory sequences. Only these regions that bind to the regulatory proteins contain those sequences. These bind to mediator proteins that then in turn bind to the transcriptional complex. Okay, yes, Taylor. So it goes from the regulator regulatory DNA sequence to the mediator that determines whether or not it's going to be activated or repressed. So the regulatory uh, sequences to the regulatory proteins okay. that then interact with mediator, which will then interact with the transcriptional complex. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. So moving on. Um, again, how are these binding? They are binding through those again. Uh, secondary structure type interactions. So they're gonna have hydrogen bonding. So these are non-covalent interactions between the protein that is the regulator and the base bearing uh, inside the DNA. Sometimes it's uh, in the phosphate, sugar phosphate backbone too, but usually it is in those exact sequences. That's how, it, what's important is the DNA, the regulatory sequence um, within the DNA that is interacting with these proteins to simulate or inhibit uh, the RNA polymerase activity, okay? Okay, uh, so any questions about transcriptional regulation before we go to chromosome modification? What are we on time, 20 more minutes or so? Yeah, 
You guys are good? Cool. So let's move on and talk about chromosome modifications. So we have talked about a little bit about that back when we started talking about DNA in the beginning of this module set. Um, and we talked about how your interface chromosomes contain both highly condensed, very, you know, packed together regions called heterochromatin, and then areas that are more open for uh, transcription. And those are your more extended chromatin in the form of euchromatin. Euchromatin is obviously more loosely packed, so it's more accessible for gene expression to occur. Um, and that's where majority of your genes are going to be expressed at any given time. Heterochromatin in general is going to be very tightly packed and not expressed. Now, some of these regions are what we call facultative heterochromatin. These can be changed back and forth as needed within a cell. Um, these are going facultative uh, chromatin is going to be heterochromatin is going to be different for each cell type and even under various different environments or different parts of life at the end of the day. But this part, the facultative heterochromatin, can go between euchromatin and heterochromatin as needed. When it's not needed, it is tightly packed. When it is needed, it gets opened up so it is uh, open and accessible for gene transcription. The other side is the constitutive uh, heterochromatin. This is always going to be packed. This is parts of your genome that are never going to be touched ever in that cell. Again, some of these may be constant, but many of these areas are going to be different for different cell types. Uh, but these regions of the chromosome are just packed forever. Now, some of this resides in the telomeres, because obviously the telomeres are not getting transcribed anymore, um, and they're just going to be there. But um, some of this is also going to be seen in the centromere, which again will always remain as your heterochromatin. But there are other reason areas that will be activated um, sometimes and inactivated others. I know, I can't even say it twice. <laughs> so, that was cute. Um, how are these happening? Well, it's happening, majority of this is happening through modifications of histone proteins that are making those nucleosomes that the DNA is wrapped around. And we talked about some of these already that they happen at specific, you know, uh, lysines, specific serines, spe uh, specific arginines, those are the ones that are going to get modified. Um, so with they, and these happen on the tails of histones. The biggest ones are histone H3 modifications. Now within it, you can see several amino acid residues that can be modified and they can be modified in more than one way. However, at any given time, they would only at, a, you know, at a particular residue, it may be methylated or acetylated. It cannot be both, right? So you can have methylation, which is the one that most people readily know about. Um, they can also be acetylated and some places can, or some serine, specific serines can be phosphorylated. Um, so all these modifications, and their combinations are important in maintaining its structure and what it means. So if you have a methylation that is specifically at this nine, uh, ninth position lysine, that usually forms heterochromatin and leads to gene silencing. That's the one that's most commonly done for heterochromatin and gene silencing formation. If you have instead an acetylation of that ninth uh, lysine, you then can express that gene even when there are methylations at other parts of that same tail. And finally, typically when a serine is phosphorylated, it leads to a much more open uh, chromatin and leads to gene expression of that uh, downstream area. So phosphorylation leads to gene expression. Uh, the lysine 9 acetylation leads to gene expression. Methylation at lysine 9 is the most important one that we talk about when we talk about heterochromatin and gene silencing. Now, the biggest example of this is in the presence of a bar body in female cells. So all our cells as females will randomly inactivate an early embryo 
one, either your paternal or maternal X chromosome. Now this process is completely random. So by chance about 50% of your cells would have inside any given organ system would have your paternal X chromosome uh, shut down by creating heterochromatin and, and a half of yours would be your maternal side. That highly inactivated, highly you know condensed chromosome shows up as this densely stained uh, you know chromosome inside our nucleus and that's what we call a bar body. So you can tell if a cell is from a female or a male based on whether they have a bar body uh, that is visible in the cell or nucleus or not. Um, now that's why any given female that you will look at in any given multicellular organism would be a mosaic. So even when we don't show it in different skin color pigmentation, we have areas of, um, we have, you know, some of our cells expressing certain X chromosome genes uh, from our paternal versus maternal side. Now, some of this is going to be stably transmitted to all remaining progeny of that cell. So these somatic cells, once they have created that bar body, any cell that could derives from that, all the descendants of those cells will have the same bar body every single time. That's also true for other types of, uh, you know, heterochromatin formation as well. So a parent cell that is regulated by a master regulator, um, maybe a totipotent cell when it first starts to become differentiated because of a single signal that it receives will then start gene expression downstream of it in response to that initial signal. Well, that transient signal, even when that signal is not there anymore, the effect of it will be there throughout that uh, all the progenies of that cell ever to come through continued cell memory. So in this case, they are showing a gene A that is regulated by a master regulator protein or a master transcriptional regulator. Once it is activated by that so that it is producing this gene A protein, it will always do that in all the progeny through continued cell memory. It is all, it's going to do that whether that signal remains there or not there regardless of that. Another thing that is, again, transmitted through progeny is the idea of methylation that it leads to imprinting response as well. And so you have these specific cytosines inside our genome. And now we're talking about genome and not the histones, right? This is actual nucleotides that can be methylated. The biggest thing is this five prime methylation on uh, the C's that are directly before a G, right? So it's the C in a CG component, it's the five prime C that is methylated every single time. So you, here you can see that this is a C that is at the five prime, but at the bottom strand, this is not on the five prime. And so it's not going to be recognized, but here you have both of them in the right orientation and they will be recognized. Um, and methylated. So once they are methylated, they are going to be recognized by the maintenance methyl transferase. So this is an unmethylated cytosine. It wasn't methylated. This is a methylated uh, dimer. It's always going to be methylated in every newly synthesized strand, whether it is um, for every daughter cell that is created. So the methyl transferases are the ones that are creating that C. Um, methylation. And then throughout replication, the me maintenance methyl transferases will remethylate the new strand to maintain that methylation imprint throughout your lifetime. Um, so these histone modifications are obviously inherited by your daughter chromosomes. So you have your parental nucleosomes that are going to get mixed and matched when replication occurs. So half of them are going to be the same approximately and half of them would be the new ones when the DNA is replicated. Well, at that time, 
methyl transferases are going to come in and they are going to recognize the pattern that is missing and they will re-input all the appropriate histone modifications and all the appropriate methyl transferase to the actual genome itself. So both the methylations of the actual Cs inside the genome, as well as histone modifications, all these acetylations and uh, methylations and phosphorylations will be maintained throughout your uh, generations of uh, cells. Okay, questions about that? About imprinting or about histone modifications? Yes, no, maybe. So what the picture tells about? Uh, who, who knows what the picture tells about? I do. You do? Oh, you don't say it excitedly though. Yeah, my mom's a Twilight fan. It's because Jacob, is it because Jacob imprinted on Bella, but he really imprinted on her child? Yes. That, uh, okay, so yeah. I haven't seen Twilight. I've only read the books. <laughs> oh my God. My mom, when my Twilight came out, my mom flipped out and I was like, oh God. Okay, so I haven't seen it, but I have like seen a little snippet of this portion. Um, but I thought, it was, I thought it was your guys kind of thing. So that's why I put it in. But um, so imprinting is how a lot of our survival instincts are taken care of, right? So initial bonding in many animals occurs because of this imprinting. Um, the ducks, right? In ducks, especially in animals in the wild, in humans, it's not as important for survival anymore, obviously, but in uh, ducks, for example, and many birds, that initial response that where they imprint on the first adult animal they see is because of this imprinting that they recognize. Okay, so yes, so he was what a werewolf right this guy and she was a half vampire or something i've read them a long time ago okay so moving on now that we have the chromosome uh regulated and we have our genes regulated from the outside uh let's talk about well that means we have thousands of genes we would need thousands of regulators but in reality, a single regulator can, uh, can actually coordinate expression of many, many, many different types of genes. So think about again, the dexamethasone experiment that you guys did, where dexamethasone as a molecule could activate, uh, you know, the regulatory dexamethasone bind to the receptor, which then translocates to the nucleus and binds to multiple places all along the genome that will regulate multiple types of genes. Anywhere there that there is that regulatory sequence for that cortisol receptor to bind, complex to bind, or the dexamethasone receptor to bind, it's gonna bind to it. And it's going to activate or repress the downstream genes in response to it. So when you have um, you know, no cortisol present or no dexamethasone present, those genes are going to be either not expressed at all are expressed at a very low rate. When they are, they have the activated receptor binding to those regulatory sequences that will jumpstart that activation to enhance that gene expression or to activate it to, the begin, to begin with, okay? So, um, and I will do a couple more slides and then we'll stop uh, because this again talks about the differentiation process that because multiple genes can be regulated by a single regulator, you don't actually need as many regulators as the type of cells you need. You just need a few regulators, just uh, a handful of them can give rise to all the cell types that you need. In this example, you see a regulatory protein that when activated makes a totipotent cell into a pluripotent cell and puts it on the path to differentiation, which then when has a second regulatory protein activation will further uh, differentiate that subtype of cells to another level. On the other hand, the cell that wasn't originally regulated by protein one can still start the differentiation process with activation of protein two. 
or three and so on and so forth. So within a few steps, you can have multiple, you know, um, cell types originating from a couple of different enhancers. So a master regulator like this in Drosophila uh, or fruit fly is called eye gene or eye regulator. Uh, it triggers the formation of an eye anytime you artificially express it in the fly embryo in any of the cells that are supposed to be whatever they want to be otherwise. So in this case, they put the eye gene artificially expressed it on the cells are in the cells that were supposed to become light. And on that light, now you have an eye structure. Uh, same thing can happen in cell culture when we do stem cell research. We can take one type of differentiated cell and differentiate it into a completely different type of cell just by regulating the expression of a specific master regulator that helps it go down a different path. Now, in our uh, in majority of our eukaryotic systems, these three master regulators can essentially control differentiation of all our cell types. And that's K uh, KLF4, SOX2, and OCT4, OCT4. These three alone, when expressed at the right time, will control differentiation into multiple different cell types and then differentiation into uh, cells that can make all types of different organ systems. This, just, this diagram essentially shows th what each one regulates. So you see, you know, KLF4 is by far the most unique. It has this whole array of different molecules it forms, uh, genes that it expresses, um, that it controls, regulates. But then it also has subsets of genes that are also going to have OCT4 expressed or SOX2 expressed. And then you have some that are going to be just expressing SOX2 or OCT4 or any combination of those. So just by having these three um, affected at just the right time, you can control all the gene differentiation, all the cell differentiation inside the body. Okay, so we're gonna stop here and we will, or actually at the next slide. So here we just kind of see how you can take the OCT4 SOX2 and uh, KLF4, and when we introduce them into fibroblast nuclei, you can allow the cells to become what we call induced pluripotent stem cells. And then we can use these cells to differentiate them into culture, in culture setting, into muscle cells, fat cells, neurons, you name it. Um, you can make them into a lot of different things. So next time we're gonna start off by talking about post-transcriptional control, which is a review of what we've already done and some other new things before we go into cell signaling, okay? Questions?